Are you ready to make the most of your oil and gas mineral rights? Welcome to the Mineral Rights Podcast. Get the knowledge and resources you need to manage your minerals and royalties. Here is your host, Matt Sands. Hello and welcome to the Mineral Rights Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Sands, and I'm here to help you make the most of your mineral rights and royalties. And my co-host, Justin Williams, joins me as always. Hey, Justin, how are you doing today? Good morning, Matt. Doing good. So, Justin, we have an interesting topic lined up for today. And what I wanted to do was walk through all of the things that go into determining where an operator is going to drill the next well. Because I know that that is always top of mind when you've just signed an oil and gas lease, you find out that someone's going to come and drill a well, hopefully sometime in the near future, you want to know, well, how do they decide whether they're going to come to my property or my neighbor's property or where are they going to go next? They have all these options. How do they come up with that plan? There's a lot that goes into it. Before we dive into that, Justin, you want to talk a little bit about when you were leasing property, what was the thought process in your mind and what was the interactions with the operator when that happened? It definitely started with the landman. That was our first interaction is, is chatting with the landman. And he educated us a lot on the situation and what was going on. And then after we had signed the lease and we were starting to be paid, it kind of shifted in the person that we were dealing with. And we were dealing with somebody that was more so with the operator. And that's kind of been how it stayed. Yeah. And that's a very common experience. We'll talk about all of those interactions, you know, as an operator figures out where they're going to go drill, when do they come approach mineral owners with what documents, what are the interactions like. So we'll talk about that. But before we do that, I think it's helpful to understand a little bit about the, I'll call it the development planning process that companies use when they're planning on drilling their next well. And there's a lot of moving parts and we'll go through all of that. And so this is part of our behind the scenes series where we're going to really break down for you what goes on within the oil companies, within the different departments, and just give you kind of behind the scenes look at all of the stuff that goes on, you know, in this whole planning process today. And this is something that I worked on when I was on the operator side and working for an oil and gas company. I was heavily involved with the planning and scheduling of the work that was going on in the field and making sure that all those moving parts were aligned and integrated. And so, you know, sat through a lot of development planning meetings with the engineers as there was discussions around where we were going to go next, what are the constraints that we're having to deal with. And we'll talk about all of that here. But I think, Justin, let's talk a little bit. What does a typical organization structure look like with one of these, you know, let's say medium size or larger size oil and gas company? Absolutely. And there's way more facets than you would think. So we have the reservoir engineering and geology. You've got development planning, regulatory and permitting, drilling and completions, finance, land, facilities engineering, and then project management. And Matt, these all play a really important role. They're they're very vital. And each one has a certain function that it plays in the overall picture. Some of these we interact with, a lot of these we don't interact with. And you know, Matt, one of the things that I think is really interesting about this is we've talked before how in the past it was kind of like taking a straw and sticking it in the ground and looking for oil. And nowadays it's much more the philosophy of measure twice, cut once. There's a lot of work up front that goes into figuring out the best place and making sure that capital is well spent. Yeah, that's a great point. There's a lot more regulatory hurdles that companies have to go through. So there needs to be a lot more upfront planning. You can't just go in, apply for a permit to drill, get it, you know, within a week and then have a rig show up the next week. So it's, it's definitely, especially now with, you know, in some of these areas, development encroaching upon that, where you have certain setback requirements to where you can actually build the well pad, you know, based on where buildings are, where schools, things like that. So there's a lot of things to go into it. Now, before we dive into those details, the thing that we'll say is that all of the things we're going to talk about today are predicated on the company having the capital budget to execute this work and having access to capital. And so that when you hear headlines about companies not getting lending from banks because of ESG reasons and things like that, that can be a constraint on how much a company can spend. Obviously, now we've talked about this time and time again about how companies are now faced to live within cash flow and only spend the money that they're taking in in terms of the oil and gas that they're selling and that they can then 
reinvest that cash flow into drilling new wells. So that is a constraint. And, you know, obviously if you had unlimited capital, the companies could go in and drill um, to a certain extent more wells perhaps than what they budget for. Currently, just because your main constraint would be, do I have a rig available? Do I have manpower available and things like that versus the the money to go spend? So the underlying constraint to all this is how much capital is available. What they do is they know roughly within a certain base interplay based on the depth of the wells and what the completion design is and all of that, an approximate cost to drill a well and to complete it. And then the cost to build the surface facilities and compressors and pipelines and all that kind of stuff. And so what they can do in the capital budgeting cycle, which happens the year before they're going to go spend money. They're doing this from like the middle of the year until the beginning of the fourth quarter, in which point they sort of solidify the budget. Uh, and then that's the set plan, at least going into the next year. They may adjust it, you know, as commodity prices come up or down, they may have to pull back, or maybe there's a, additional funds that they can go drill a couple extra wells because the price of oil is quite a bit higher. Those are the types of adjustments that are made, you know, throughout the year. But going into the year, they have to determine, you know, how much money they have from that. They can figure out how many wells they can drill. And based on the timing, you know, how long it takes to drill a well, they can figure out, okay, well, now we need to contract for X number of drilling rigs next year. Maybe that's one, two, three, four, five, ten, whatever the number is. And then they can feed that information after it's been approved by the board of directors. And then it goes to the uh, folks within the, the different work groups that we're going to talk about to go and execute the plan. And that starts with setting up long-term contracts with drilling contractors and service companies and things like that, and making sure they have a place in line so that next year when they want to go drill that well, that they've put all the moving parts in motion that a rig will actually be available for them to drill a well. So that all this has to happen well in advance. So there's a lot of planning that goes into it. So all that said, Justin, you know, one of the things, first steps is when the geologists and reservoir engineers identify the best locations in the field. And as you can imagine, not all of the geology is the same within a particular basin or play. There's some parts that are maybe more more oil, more gas, maybe there's they're thicker. So what they're looking at when they do this, if it's an exploration play, they're doing this with a lot of seismic data using other similar areas, similar geology to say, well, this area held oil, you know, this was a similar structure that we're going after, similar type of formation. And so they can say, you know, this is what we think is going on there. We have core data from and logs from some existing wells that were maybe drilled. Maybe they were unsuccessful, maybe they were successful. They can start to do that science work basically to figure out what they think is there in terms of the volumes of oil and gas, do the reservoir modeling. You know, sort of a lot of theoretical stuff trying to determine what's going on in this exploration phase. What we're going to primarily talk about today is in the development phase in a more mature oil and gas play. And this is certainly the case, you know, as you've seen, Justin, with the headlines, you know, we have a lot of oil and gas options, a lot of different shale plays that are out there. And you continually hear of operators going into the Permian Basin and now going into this particular county. and going into the, the Haynesville shale because the price of gas is up. And all of these things have been around for a while now. Absolutely. And you know, it makes a lot of sense for the infrastructure standpoint. If they can't get it to market, then it makes it difficult. And Matt, you know, those things you talked about. So the net result of that is they identify the best locations that have the best potential for the wells that have the best economics. And as you mentioned, as the oil and gas play matures, it's more accurate and reliable, and they, they know what, more of what they're getting into. They can have more predictable returns. Potential locations are mapped out for calculating oil and gas reserves, and this preliminary location is refined. And then with help from the land, regulatory, and drilling and completion groups, they're able to move forward. The wells and drilling space and units are ranked based on the best economics, the most economic being the ones with the highest returns or prioritized first and so on down the line. The information is provided to the development planner to put into a Gantt chart to come up with anticipated timing for when the well pads will be surface facilities and then the wells will be drilled. Last but not least, they'll be completed and fracked and then the flowed back and hooked up to cells. It's a huge plan, Matt. There's a lot that goes into this and you know, I, I think this is a little bit like building a home. It seems like there's so much that happens up front before you really start to see any results. Yeah, to your point, this 
project plan has a lot of dependencies. You know, they have to continually adjust it to as new information comes available as far as regulatory constraints. For example, they may have selected a well pad location and then they have to go and take a look at what kind of wildlife is there. And if there's like a nesting raptor or something like that, they'd say, oh, well, now there's a nest here. We can't come in until that nest is vacant. We had that next on our drill plan, but we can't go there because there's a raptor there. So now they have to adjust and say, okay, we're going to have to move this pad up, flip flop it with this other one, and then you know adjust everything down the line. So there's a lot of moving pieces to this, and it has to be continually adjusted as they get more information. Unfortunately, it's not just a easy as just here's where we're going to go. And then it's, it's set to that and, and they just go do it. So a lot of times there's things that they have to adjust for. Now, if they've done the planning up front, that is taken into account. You know, they've planned ahead. The thing that is done a lot, you have everybody that is going to be executing work on the well pad that will sit down and do what's called like a pad planning meeting. And that's where they have a CAD drawing of what the well pad is going to look like, where the well surface locations are going to be, where the surface facilities are going to be, how much space do they have to set the equipment while they're drilling, while they're completing. And so they work through all of that to make sure the well pad will be large enough to safely accommodate all of those people that need to work on the pad at the same time if they're going to be doing what's called simultaneous operations or SIMOP. So that's something that's looked at and that goes into the plan as far as when they go do the surface use agreement, you know, how many acres do we need to to be getting for this well pad. And so that is that is also something that is done. Um, the thing that is really important is that every group within the organization needs to contribute to the process and be involved in order for that to be a success. And each group has their own set of steps that we're not even going to talk about today that are required. And there's a certain amount of timing that goes in to those steps in order to have things like a drilling permit in time, right? So the regulatory folks have to plan ahead of when they're going to actually need that permit to do all of the studies, to do the surveys, to do all of that stuff so that when they go file for the the drilling permit, that they have all the information they need to get that approved. Again, we have this high-level development plan that the groups can then use with, you know, working back from when the well is going to be spud. In other words, when they're going to start drilling the well and then they can go and say, okay, six months before that, we need to apply for the permits or you know whatever the timing is in that basin or play. And again, this all varies by basin or play and because of what state you're in and the regulatory requirements and all of that. So there's a lot of upfront planning. In fact, I've seen in some cases like in the Marcellus in Pennsylvania, you know, the, the pre, the upfront planning steps, there was, you know, 30 or 40 steps that had to be done in order to get the regulatory requirements in, in place so that they could actually go and do the work in the field. So there's a ton of work that goes into this up front. You know, Matt, and I think something that creates confusion for a lot of mineral owners is we often see a lot of drilling permits that have been placed by the operator and they don't get drilled. And I think you're kind of touching on an area here of, of where it starts to make sense and that there's this pre-planning happening and, and things change at the end of the day, but these departments are, are trying to get everything lined up so that they're not waiting on them to move forward. And Matt, so now they know where they're going to drill. Now they have an idea of when they're going to drill. And after they have the permits, time to get the owners taken care of. So they've got to figure out who owns the property, surface use agreements, like you mentioned, make sure that they are set up for the royalties. And that kind of leads us into the land and lease department. Yeah. And cases where we're in a mature play, like most of these shale basins at this point, they already have a certain area that's been leased up. Each operator has staked their claim, so to speak. And so if you're going to try to expand, you really have to go into acquisition mode. This isn't where, unless you're selectively picking up oil and gas leases where maybe some other company overlooks a lease expiration, but usually you need a percentage, large percentage, a majority of the oil and gas leases in the area you intend to drill in order to be able to force pool. In some cases, you need to have a certain percentage of the leases already before you can file for a pooling order and things like that. And, you know, if you're in in the fringe part, maybe the areas that aren't, maybe leases have expired and maybe there's some opportunity sort of expand in those areas that you think are still going to be good. That could be where you work with the geologist and the reservoir engineer to find 
where the sweet spots are in those areas that are now coming available to lease again. And so then you just have to stay on top of, you know, obtaining leases. But in any case, what happens is the operator will work with the title attorney to obtain a title opinion around all the mineral and leasehold interests in the proposed drilling spacing unit. And this ensures that they're actually contacting the right people to obtain an oil and gas lease. So an oil and gas lease doesn't do you any good if you contacted the wrong person that no longer owns the minerals. You know, that that doesn't going to help you. It's not going to protect you when you show up with a rig and find out that they're unleased mineral owners and maybe they, you know, haven't been pooled, forced pooled or whatever. So there's some steps that need to happen to make sure you've identified those people, you've contacted them, and that is usually part of that regulatory um, paperwork when you go to in states that allow for statutory pooling. We have to prove that you went out and tried to contact the mineral owners, that you made them a competitive offer, and that you gave them enough time to respond. And then for the people that didn't respond or said no, then you know the, the next step is that you can go into the process of getting pooling order and to then force pool them so you could drill some horizontal wells. Now, some some states don't allow for this, and we'll talk about that here in a second. But in essence, you want to make sure you're, you got all the leases in place before the rig shows up. In parallel to all of this, the land department, like we talked about, after they've identified where they want to put the surface locations, in other words, the well pads, they will go out to the surface owners and start contacting those surface owners to try to get what's called a surface use agreement. And that basically gives them the right to come in and build a well pad. We'll pay damages to the surface owner while that well pad is in existence and you know, just basically allows them to, to do that and what the requirements will be from a landowner perspective. And again, this is the surface land department that deals with this. And there's a lot of you know moving parts. And a lot of times in a bigger company, they split the mineral land side from the surface land. Now, some, it's sort of all together. But in any case, a, a landman within the company will be working on this with either a contract landman that approaches a surface owner or somebody within the company. So that is a, a critical step. And really, that's why, to your point, Justin, sometimes they have the need to make adjustments. You know, maybe they permit wells based on an assumption of where they're going to be able to get a surface use agreement. Maybe they even get a surface use agreement, but when they go to file the location permit, there's some irreconcilable differences with the regulatory agency that says, no, you can't drill there anymore. You need to move to a different location if you're going to drill this well pad or this drilling spacing unit. So that is an issue that does come up. Absolutely. And indeed, there's so many points within this where, you know, snags can come up and you mentioned a title opinion. And I know that's something in the industry that they're very expensive to have a title opinion done. And it certainly could skew whether, you know, it's worth it, not worth it. If you have an owner that isn't cooperating, all kinds of things. Absolutely. Yeah. So the, Justin, you want to talk about some of the regulatory steps that next happen? We talked about the statutory pooling and what are the things that go into that? Absolutely. So in some states, a pooling and spacing order must be obtained to get approval for the desired number of wells and the pool, the mineral tracks together to allow for the horizontal development. The reservoir engineer will determine the optimal well spacing and prepare the information and the land department will prepare justification for pooling mineral tracks together and document where they have oil and gas leases or where they have tried to attain a lease but could not. And as Matt mentioned, the forced pooling there. At the same time, the regulatory groups works in to obtain a location permit so that the company can build that well pad at the desired location. If there's the regulatory constraints like the wildlife, surface water, pond, or stream setbacks, as Matt mentioned, then they may have to work with the land department and engineering to select a different surface location for the well pad. At the same time, the company applies for those location permits. They'll also file an application for permit to drill or an APD. These permits will outline the drilling plan, well bore location, identify nearby well bores of existing wells, and how they will mitigate collision with these wells, as well as other details around leasing, spacing unit, pooling spacing orders. For some jurisdictions like Texas, where statutory pooling does not exist, there may be provisions for what is called an allocation well. This includes the specific portion of the peripherated lateral length that goes through each unit or lease for the determination of how the pooled mineral owners will get their proportional share of the royalties. Regulatory folks, you know, this is someone that I don't think mineral owners really have very much interaction with, but I know sometimes you see their names on the documents that's filed with like the Texas RCC or the Colorado Oil and Gas Commission, for example, and, you know, not necessarily customer facing though. 
Yeah. So if you see that a company has filed for a drilling permit, just a little bit of inside baseball, that is usually a good indication that they're you know planning on doing something, right? So if you look at across a field and let's say you have minerals in multiple tracks and you have one track that has permits that have been filed, well, that'd be a good indication that the operator, let's say, is going to drill that tract first versus the other one that doesn't have permits. Because like we talked about, there's a lot of upfront work that goes into this and it takes a lot of manpower and resources and expenses to actually get to the point where you're filing for the permit. So that is one good indication that they are planning on doing something. Now, to Justin's point, things can change. You know, you may have adjustments to the plan. They may have indicated on some of the paperwork that they're planning on spudding or, you know, drilling the surface casing at a certain time period and that time period may elapse and then they go to another pad instead. And maybe that's because they've changed their drilling schedule and changed the order of when they were going to drill some of those well pads. And so that could be a possible reason. You know, again, you may have differences, you know, changes in commodity prices and all of a sudden they're pulling back and they're not drilling as many wells. And so that timing is going to be at risk of actually being able to drill that well before the permit expires. So there's many times where an operator may obtain a permit, but then things change and they have to go and adjust their their schedule and maybe they're going to different locations. They pull back on the capital they're spending, whatever the reason, and they don't go and drill those wells before the permits expire. So it's no guarantee is kind of what I'm getting at, but it is a good indication that they're planning on doing something. Absolutely. And then engineering. So this is something that, you know, I it, initially in oil and gas, this was not something I thought about at all. But I don't know about you, Matt, but I've never tried to stick something 20,000 foot into the ground. I and mean, I've certainly never tried to turn it right. But, you know, engineering is, is a huge part of it. And from the engineering standpoint, a lot of the work goes on behind the scenes for the drilling engineer. They design the well bore, and the completions engineer to come up with the optimal well completion procedure. And that includes, you know, the casing where it, uh, where the casing is going to be set, the kickoff point for where the well bore will go from vertical uh, to turn to build a horizontal orientation, the build curve radius and other horizontal directional drilling calculations to make sure that bending stresses aren't too much and make sure that the rock properties for the formations they will be drilling through are taken into account. And Matt, there's just so much. And this is such a specialized type of engineering. I know the Colorado School of Mines is very well known for it and there's a few others, but this is really very technical and very specific skill set. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. It is a very specific skill set. It marries engineering with some of the earth sciences so that you're taking into account some of those properties of the rock when you're coming up with what pressures are we going to encounter down hole, what kind of equipment do we need to specify so that there's not a blowout or a safety issue. So all of that falls under the the specialty of petroleum engineer. Like you mentioned, where I went to school, the Colorado School of Mines is an excellent program there. Texas A&M has another good one, UT. So there's, you know, there's a handful of schools. It's not every engineering school that offers petroleum engineering. It is very specialized. And it's a critically important job for when you're going to drill a well, you know, there's a lot of calculations that go into it. And, and a lot has been learned, you know, over the past hundred plus years as we've been drilling oil and gas wells, you know, how do we do this safely and repeatably? And so all of that goes into this. And so, you know, again, as they go in, the first few wells they drill in a basin, there's a lot of engineering, a lot of data that goes into it, and they may make adjustments as they learn, as they drill each subsequent well to make sure that they're improving. And, you know, that's one thing that I saw when I was working for an operator was the mindset of continuous improvement. It was every well, how do we optimize? How do we improve? How do we reduce the time it took to drill that well? How do we do it You know, as a result for money? How do we do it more safely? All of that stuff goes into the design and engineering of all of these. And so that's that definitely goes into it from a, from a drilling engineering standpoint. And then the completions and engineer is going to work with their specialists that are you know, very much, even within petroleum engineering, you know, with the, like I mentioned, the drilling engineer, you have, may have a mud engineer that's looking at the mud design and the exact fluids they're pumping down to circulate and bring the cuttings out of the hole as they're drilling and all of that. And then the completion side, the completions engineer is going to work with the service company to come up with the best completion design and the type of frack that they're going to do. 
And again, now we have a ton of data. There's been thousands of these horizontal wells drilled in these shale basins, and they've done different mixes of water to sand and the different additives they put in. And they're coming up with how does that completion design affect the productivity of the well? So they can then plot, you know, we did these types of completions with this much water and this much sand, and this was the result. And then the next pad over, we tried more sand and more water. And then here was the result that improved, you know, the uh, production or didn't. And then they can adjust that to where they're optimizing for the best design to maximize the production from that well, which is ultimately going to help with the economics. And so they're going to try to balance that out. Now, speaking of economics, Justin, there's a whole finance team that is behind the scenes working on all of this as well. Absolutely. And so, you know, once the engineering team comes up with the cost estimates for the civil earth work to build the pad, to build service facilities, drill the well, complete the well, and then hook up the gathering pipeline, the reservoir engineer will rerun the economics and work with the finance team to prepare the authority for expenditure or the AFE. This is the formal document that approves allocating the budget for drilling of these wells. Management will appro- review that AFE and then signs off on the final cost associated with it. And then Matt, From there, the land department will send these AFEs to the non-operated working interest partners for their approval. If a non-operated working interest partner does not want to pay their proportional share of the cost of drilling, then they'll be deemed as non-consent on the well. And they will not get paid until the operator recoups the original cost plus a penalty as compensation for carrying the interest. Yeah, so the thing to note here is if you do have a non-operated working interest, you may have seen the AFE, you know, if an operator proposes a new well or maybe they have to go and do a major repair on the well, they'll present you with an AFE to sign and so that you can pay your proportional share of that cost and it'll tell you how much you're on the hook for. And then you have to decide whether you're going to pay that or you're going to go non-consent like we talked about and then you know forego the, the future revenue from that well until the operator recoups the cost plus a, a penalty. And all of this, you know, at the beginning of deciding where to drill next. So there's all these types of decisions. And now these last couple are more of the the final steps in that process. But all of this, like I said, is kind of the what I call the development planning process. And it's where operators are going to go next is usually determined by constraints that they're faced with, along with the economics of those wells. So they're going to try to target the most profitable wells first. And then over time, they may have to shuffle in some others that are maybe less optimal from a geology standpoint, just because, again, we talked about there's so many constraints, so many moving pieces that practically speaking, in order to keep a drilling rig active, you know, they can't, it's more efficient for them to continually drill one well pad to the next. And so they're paying for it, whether it's being used or not. So they want to maximize the amount of productive time on that rig. So effectively, they're, wanting to look at logistics. You know, this is a whole nother piece we didn't even talk about, but in some locations you have logistics from moving from one well pad to the next. And maybe they decide to go to two well pads that are closer together because it's a shorter rig move. It's a shorter amount of time to rig down, move the rig to the next location, and then move in and rig up. And they want to minimize that non-productive time on the rig because Time is money, literally, with with a drilling rig. You're paying for it anyway, and so they need to make sure it's turning to the right as much as possible. And that's why they try to shuffle this around. So that's a whole other thing we didn't even talk about when they look at the location of these well pads relative to each other. You know, where can they minimize that productive time on the rig by moving to locations that are relatively close to each other? And then, you know, the roads in between and what kind of road maintenance is required to move a rig on the road. All of that goes into it. So it's it's a very complex system. Absolutely, Matt. And on top of that, you know, worth mentioning, but something that we're not going to get deep into, there are other facets that these departments handle as well. And, you know, once the well is completed and it's gone into kind of a operational mode, the land department has facets that handle owner operations. The finance departments will often interact in a limited way with mineral owners for royalty audits or that kind of thing. And then for inquiries where you're not in pay status, there's a department that, you know, is doing that land and title research and, you know, going back and back paying you and all that fun stuff. And so, I think something worth thinking about is the oil companies have to continue to grow and and drill new wells to ensure they stay profitable, but there's still a workload as well being carried over from maintaining these wells. 
No, that's a great point. Yeah, we, we're not even talking about all of the production engineers, all of the operations personnel, the pumpers, all the people in the field that are operating the equipment and the wells and maintaining that. You know, there's a whole team that's out there that's working to make sure that the operations go off safely and that they try to make sure the production keeps flowing. You know, there's a lot that goes into that as well. But, you know, we're just really focusing today on the um, you know, the determination of where they drill next, all the things that are the considerations that go into those decisions. And, you know, hopefully at the end of this, it'll result in drilling a successful well or multiple wells, and then you start getting paid royalties. And so there's really no better feeling, Justin, when you have minerals that maybe were unleased to signing an oil and gas lease to then the operator going and drilling wells, and then you get a division order and then you start getting paid royalties. That's that's just an amazing feeling. Yep, absolutely. You, you nailed it. And it's amazing how long it seems it takes, but it it is worth it. And it's because it does take a long time. There's so much going into that process. There, there's a lot that goes into it. Not even when they spud the well and all the stuff that goes on after that. We talk about that in you know step-by-step in more detail in episode 15, uh, where that episode is titled, They Are Going to Drill My Land, How Long Before I Start Getting Paid Oil and Gas Royalties. And uh, you know, to your point, it always seems like it won't move fast enough. You want it to happen tomorrow. You want to start getting those royalty checks. But you know, rest assured, it'll happen eventually once they start to drill the well, once they complete it, if it's a successful well. You know, there's steps that will occur and you'll get the division order and you'll be able to start receiving royalties soon after that. Uh, the thing that is important to remember is your interactions with these operators, you know, be proactive as you're talking to folks. If you find out, you know, that an operator is going to drill on your uh, minerals next, let's say they've permitted wells, maybe there's information within those permits you can glean the relative timing of when they're going to come do that. That is something I rec- recommend all mineral owners do is to stay on top of that. And if you notice that permits have been filed, go to the State Oil and Gas Commission, go to the Railroad Commission, wherever the minerals are located, pull those drilling permits and read them. Look at the plat, look at the maps. All this stuff is public information typically, at least for the drilling permits. And so you can go in there and look at that stuff. And a lot of times there'll be um, additional documentation, sundries and other notices that are filed that'll have dates on them and tell you when they're planning on going in drilling, or maybe there is a requirement to fill out a particular form and submit it to the Oil and Gas Commission to give them notice when they plan on spudding the well. And so you can get an idea if you're not there locally and can't go drive by and see whether there's a rig there or not, you can go to the State Oil and Gas Commission website and look and see, have they spud that well yet? Did they change the status on the website? Or is there that form that says they've, they've spud the well? So that's definitely information you should go and look for. It's readily available. Now, like Justin mentioned, one of the things that you'll, you'll deal with as you go through the process, you'll be dealing with typically the land department. And that's because they handle the questions and the paperwork for producing properties as well as when they go and lease you. So your first interaction with a company is usually when you sign an oil and gas lease. We talk about that in more detail in episode six on how to negotiate an oil and gas lease. If you're in a situation where you own the surface rights and they're coming to get a surface use agreement, we cover that in more detail in episode 23 on how to negotiate a surface use agreement. So there's a lot of considerations that go into that. But you know, once you get to the point of a well permit being filed, or certainly once they've drilled the well, then things are going to move on from there and hopefully you'll be getting paid royalties soon after that. So Absolutely, Matt. And, you know, as part of the behind the scenes series that we're doing here, we've got some awesome interviews lined up that I think will be wonderful for people. But if there's any other aspects that people would like to see behind the scenes, we would certainly take the suggestions, Matt, and they can email you at feedback at mineralrightspodcast.com. But we're excited to do this and think it'll be an interesting adventure to start really getting into the behind the scenes aspects of the industry. Absolutely. Yeah. And the next one we have lined up is going to be a discussion with the landman. So, you know, you've talked with landmen before. And so we're going to kind of get behind the scenes of that whole profession and sort of what they do and, uh, you know, what are the things that their considerations when they contact mineral and royalty owners. And so you'll find out more about that in a future episode. And then as always, you can find the resources that we mentioned in this episode in the show notes at mineralrightspodcast.com. So thanks again for listening. Thanks, Justin. Thanks, Matt. 
Thanks so much for listening to the Mineral Rights Podcast with your host, Matt Sands. Don't forget to subscribe and share at mineralrightspodcast.com. The Mineral Rights Podcast should not be construed as investment, legal, or tax advice. All information is believed to be from reliable sources. However, we make no representation as to its completeness or accuracy.